fluid management in this post-operative uh, time is must be meticulous as many vascular patients have significant heart disease and will not tolerate fluid overload. A few guidelines for fluid administration should make fluid management easier. Patients leaving the operating room after large amounts of fluids have been given, and most of this fluid is sequestered in interstitial spaces and will remain there until it is slowly mobilized and excreted in 48 to 72 hours. In addition, inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone results in sodium and water retention. Therefore, post-operative fluids should be limited to about 80 ml per hour or one ml per kilogram body weight per hour of uh, IV fluids. When needed, the rate of intravenous fluids can be increased or bolus fluid given. Some patients are cold and vasoconstricted when they arrive in the recovery area. As they rewarm and vasodilate, additional fluids may be appropriate indicated by decreased output, low filling pressures, and tachycardia. If the hemoglobin is less than eight grams per deciliter or hematocrit less than 25%, packed red blood cells should be transfused. Otherwise, volume replacement may be made with a bolus, five to 10 ml per kilogram of a balanced salt solution or Ringer's lactated solution. On the, third or uh, on the second or third post-operative day, the patients may begin to mobilize excess fluid. So maintenance intravenous rates may be needed to be reduced or even stopped. If the patient is edematous and urine output has not increased, a small dose of 10 to 20 milligrams of furosemide may initiate a good diuresis. After aortic bypass or aortic reconstructions, Diet with liquids is indicated with the presence or return of bowel sounds and flatters, and advanced as tolerated. Nasogastric tube decompression is necessary if the patient develops abdominal distension, nausea, ileus, and can result from extensive lysis of adhesions or dissection of the duodenum. Narcotics will also slow bowel motility. Appetite after aortic reconstruction is usually very poor and patients generally do not resume normal caloric intake for several weeks. A weight loss of five to 10 pounds is not uncommon in the first month following surgery. Patients with lower extremity bypass can resume an actual diet or resume normal diet, usually on the same day as surgery once they are fully awake. Wound care requires special attention. Since Local infection may rapidly extend to a prosthetic graft or cause a bacteremia that could see the graft surface. Initial dressings should be removed on the first post-operative day and the wound inspected. If the wound is healed, no further dressing is needed, but a simple gauze covering may be helpful to protect groin wounds and absorb sweat. If serosanguinous fluid is leaking from the wound, a sterile gauze dressing should be applied until the drainage stops. Lymph leaks from groin wounds and groin incisions may be treacherous, since infection of the deeper inguinal lymphatics may also infect an adjacent graft. Prolonged lymph leakage occurs and increases the risk of bacteri bacterial invasion of the perigraph lymphatics and may result in an early prosthetic graft infection. But most minor lymph leaks will resolve in three to five days. If groin lymph leak is copious and not decreased or closed in three to five days, wound exploration, ligation of the culprit nodes or lymph uh, vessels and reclosures is strongly recommended. With regards to ambulation, the proper time to ambulate a patient after peripheral arterial reconstruction is another controversial area. Proper timing is individualized with consideration of the following. Many patients with aortic re reconstructions are not hemodynamically stable for 24 to 48 hours. 
and tachycardia with swings in blood pressure is not well tolerated at this time. Furthermore, within 20, 48 to 72 hours, mobilization of fluid expands intravascular volume, placing additional stress on the heart. If hemodynamically labile patients attempt to ambulate before tachycardia is controlled and fluids are mobilized, they may experience myocardial ischemia. Myocardial infarction occurs most commonly on the third post-operative day. If the patient has an inguinal uh, lymph leak, it is most likely to stop if lower extremity activity is curtailed by bed rest. Since ambulation may be delayed, we insist that the patients perform leg exercises, flexion and extension of the calf and thigh muscles for at least five minutes every hour. These exercises improve venous emptying from calf muscles and are prophylaxis for deep vein thrombosis. The leg exercises also increase blood flow to the legs and consequently through any graft. Finally, these exercises help maintain leg muscle tone prior to ambulation. In our experience, delayed ambulation in some patients has not really increased pulmonary complications or venous thromboembolism, provided coughing, deep breathing, appropriate mechanical and pharma pharmacologic DVT prophylaxis, and footboard exercises are performed routinely. No pneumatic compression devices should be placed on legs after an intrageniculate bypass. Now edema can be a problem after revascularization and is multifactorial owing to lymphatic trauma. Reperfusion uh, and dysfunctional vascular regulation can also can contribute to uh, edema. However, usually after two to four days, edema can be really easily manageable. When not ambulatory, the patient should be supine with the leg elevated. If reconstruction is above the knee, compression hose or compression stockings may be helpful. Below knee and pedal bypass may require longer periods of leg elevation as tissue loss and incisions may be compromised by significant edema. Prolonged sitting is to be avoided. Not uncommonly, edema after lower extremity revascularization may last for several weeks to months, even after discharge. And fitted graded compression stockings and elevation of the legs are useful. Some uh, notes on preparations for endovascular interventions are as follows. Prior to angiography, the endovascular specialist should review the patient's history, lab works, and indications for the procedure. The informed consent forms are also reviewed, and the patient and his or her family should have the opportunity to ask last minute questions. A quick physical exam should be performed just prior to the procedure to confirm previous findings and assure no interval change. Distal pulses or Doppler signals should be confirmed prior to angiography and ankle brachial indices recorded if a lower extremity intervention is likely. Comparison of the pulse examination before and after intervention is essential because the absence of a pulse or Doppler signal after intervention implies embolization vessel occlusion, or a poor technical result. ABIs are obtained in follow-up after lower extremity revascularization and intervention and compared objectively with pre-procedural values. An evaluation of the plant access vessel, for example, the femoral artery or the brachial artery, is critical in the pre-procedure uh, holding area. The absence or definition of this pulse should prompt reconsideration of the access site, except in cases of access distal to known disease, that is the target of intervention. For example, access of the femoral, femoral artery, which is distal to iliac disease, which is the target of intervention. Newly recognized or poorly managed medical conditions, such as severe uh, hypertension, arrhythmias, 
diabetes mellitus, or acute worsening of renal insufficiency may require delaying or even postponing uh, or canceling the procedure altogether. Patients with foot ulcers or gangrene should have their wounds reassessed as they may benefit from a debridement prior to or just following the endovascular procedure in the appropriate operating room. Allergy to iodinated contrast material should be ascertained and can occur in about two to 5% of patients. These reactions are usually mild with itching and urticaria, but severe anaphylactic reactions may occur, manifested by uh, wheezing, bradycardia, and hypotension. Patients with prior contrast reactions are at higher risk for uh, recurrent allergic complications with angiography. In this high risk group, we generally recommend uh, that a PrEP consisting of steroids and diphenhydramine be administered prior to the angiogram. One such uh, regimen or protocol is called the Greenberger protocol, which includes 50 milligrams of prednisone by mouth, 13, seven, and then one hour prior to the procedure and a single dose of 25 to 50 milligrams of diphenhydramine can be given. When an urgent angiogram or CT angiogram is needed, an urgent prep can also be administered with intravenous doses of diphenhydramine and hydrocortisone, but may be less effective. Frequently, patients scheduled to receive iodinated contrasts are asked as to their history of seafood or topical iodine uh, allergy. But really, it is a myth that these particular allergies will have any relationship to contrast allergy, and patients do not require a special prep prior to contrast exposure. Contrast allergy is mediated by a separate non-IgE pathway and is largely driven by osmolality of contrast relative to the blood. It is very important and care should be taken for the use of iodinated contrast in patients that the patient should be asked about his or her current medications. We should know whether the patient is taking metformin or metformin containing medications because patients on metformin are at high risk for a rare but potentially lethal lactic acidosis that can be precipitated by contrast injections. Anticoagulants such as warfarin should be stopped before procedures that involve arterial access. This usually means uh, stopping the medication for two to four days prior to the procedure to allow them to be cleared from the system. In case of warfarin, most prefer the INRs to decrease below 1.5 prior to the performance of elective arteriography and intervention. The indications for anticoagulation must also be considered prior to stopping the blood thinner before an elective procedure, because maybe sometimes and most of the time, these patients who have heart valves or recent serious thrombotic or embolic events will be on these uh, anticoagulants and it may not be safe to discontinue anticoagulation and thus other strategies will need to be considered. For example, as mentioned earlier, a heparin uh, or low molecular weight heparin window or bridging strategy can be used in patients at high risk for thrombosis or thromboembolism. Now, antiplatelet agents such as aspirin and or clopidogrel are commonly taken also by patients with peripheral vascular disease and those with uh, accompanying cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease. In rare cases, these medications can be stopped prior to the procedure. But in most instances, we prefer the patient to continue antiplatelet medication up to and immediately following the intervention. Renal function is uh, grossly assessed by measuring serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen, although the more sensitive measure is calculation of the EGFR. Contrast material can be nephr nephrotoxic, especially in the elderly, patients who are dehydrated, those with diabetes, and patients with renal insufficiency. 
Skin prep, skin prep of the access or puncture site should include cleaning with an antiseptic, uh, such as for hexidin, and in case of femoral access, both groins should be prepped. Pre-procedural antibiotics are not necessary for routine angiography. However, antibiotics may be beneficial prior to implanting a permanent intravascular stent or if the access site includes puncturing a previously placed prosthetic graft. Post-procedure care for endovascular interventions. Any patient who has undergone arteriography should be monitored hourly for at least four to six hours in uh, such because most early complications become evident during this time period. The baseline post-procedure examination should include evaluation of the patient's general appearance and the mental status, heart rate, blood pressure, inspection of a puncture or access site, and the palpation of the extremities, uh, pulses, including Doppler signals, and a check of the hematocrit if there are any signs of bleeding. In addition, adequate hydration should be maintained for 12 to 24 hours after the procedure, since contrast material causes a diuresis that can lead to dehydration. The combination of diuresis and nephrotoxicity from the contrast material can damage and can uh, deteriorate renal function, especially in patients with diabetes mellitus and or baseline chronic kidney disease. Post-intervention uh, re recovery, we need to also consider uh, sheet removal and access site management. At the completion of a catheter-based procedure, the final step is the sheet removal. Removing the access sheet following endovascular procedures performed in the higher pressure arterial system is more involved and includes several important considerations. To achieve an adequate and safe seal of the arterial entry site, one must consider the following factors. The size of the access sheet, and whether or not anticoagulation was used during the procedure. If the procedure is a basic arteriogram performed through a five French sheet and no anticoagulant is used, the sheet can be pulled out at the end of the case and manual pressure held for 20 to 25 minutes to achieve a safe arterial seal. In these cases, with no use of any closure device, we generally recommend the patient lay supine for four to six hours after the pressure has been held. If the procedure has been performed through a five to seven French sheet, including administration of heparin, a consideration of using closure devices should be done. Alternatively, we can wait until the heparin effect dissipates and then pull the sheet and hold manual pressure for 20 to 25 minutes, followed by six hours of bed rest. If the arterial procedure required an eight French sheet or larger, some type of closure device should be used. Although percutaneous closure devices reduce time to hemostasis and help with early mobilization of the patient, they may also add to the cost of endovascular uh, procedure. And uh, in addition, uh, closure devices may be maldeployed and may result in arterial occlusion and hemorrhage and rarely may become infected. For these reasons, some specialists still prefer using manual pressure techniques for basic five to six French cases in which no heparin was used. After endovascular procedures involving an intervention for lower extremity occlusive disease, Standard care usually involves maximal antiplatelet therapy, including aspirin and clopidogrel. Similar to open reconstruction, certain intrageniculate or intrapopletial interventions may warrant anticoagulation, but this is not yet well defined. Patients with manual pressure used for hemostasis after sheet removal should remain supine for six hours. 
If a closure device is used, we have to remain supine for two to four hours, barring any problems. Monitoring of the revascularization is similar to those uh, mentioned above for open operation, and we obtain duplex ultrasound and pressure studies on lower extremity endovascular interventions in follow-up in order to assess patency and physiologic improvement. Patients are usually able to be discharged the same day for endovascular procedures, or maybe 24 hours later, unless foot sepsis or other medical conditions require inpatient care. So we have seen how the CLT patient is really particularly complex. No single physician is able to effectively and efficiently address all aspects of uh, care of this patient. For best outcomes, it is necessary to employ an interdisciplinary approach versus a multidisciplinary approach, where all members in the clinical and administrative arenas are fully engaged at every step of the patient's journey of healing. Many institutes and government agencies have responded to the growing complexity, options, and subspecialization of treating a complex medical conditions by creating disease-specific centers of excellence. A center of excellence is a virtual or physical location with a team of highly skilled experts who are often involved in research and innovation to advance their field. This may be an evolving solution for the most complete management of the CLTI patient. In conclusion, chronic limb threatening ischemia or CLTI is associated with significant mortality, amputation, and impaired quality of life. The variability in practice patterns is high, contributing to a broad disparity in the use of treatments and clinical outcomes. The global vascular guidelines are focused on the goals of improving evidence-based care and highlighting critical research needs through the standardization of nomenclature, disease staging, plan and EBR concepts, endpoints and trial designs, and the uh, introduction uh, and uh, recommendation of interdisciplinary teams. This global vascular guidelines promote standardization of study designs and endpoints and the importance of interdisciplinary teams and centers of excellence for amputation prevention is stressed as a key health system initiative. With that, I'd like to thank you for your valuable time and I'd like to say especially thank you to the frontline workers for continually putting yourselves uh, in front of risk uh, for the service of society and our, and our community. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon.